So it may seem a little unusual to say happy Memorial Day. I'm not sure those words would be the most appropriate, but we want to make sure that we remember and we honor the 1.2 million men and women of the U.S. military who lost their lives serving our country. The first Memorial Day was in 1866 in Waterloo, New York, shortly after the Civil War. Over 600,000 people died in the Civil War. Now, it wasn't until 1971 that Congress actually made this an official holiday and they declared the last Monday in May to be celebrated as Memorial Day. Now, look at Exodus chapter 12 with me. This is a day to remember from generation to generation. Lots of us are going to be outside this weekend. Lots of us are going to be at the lake. Lots of us are going to have picnics. It's a beautiful weekend. I just want to encourage you not to forget what it's truly about and to remind your children, maybe even to remind ourselves, of what Memorial Day really signifies. So we remember and we don't want to forget those men and women who've died in service of our country, but even more importantly, we want to remember and not forget where our true safety and protection comes from. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 25. When God gives you rest from your enemies, do not forget. In Psalm 119, my life is in danger, I will not forget your instruction. Yes, absolutely, please remember and do not forget the American soldiers who have died to protect our country. But our true safety and our true security does not come from the American soldier, it comes from God Almighty. Amen? Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the opportunity to remember today, for the opportunity to look to you for safety and protection, to thank you for the sacrifices that you have made for this country. Lord, we thank you for the power of the Holy Spirit who brings a understanding to these words today and for the Holy Spirit who, as we gaze at Jesus, transforms us into the same image. Thank you, Father, for all that you're gonna do today. Thank you for the revelation that we're gonna find in you. And we ask these things in Jesus Christ, our Lord, amen. So the Bible is full of memorials. Now, a memorial is something where we remember the goodness of God. Look with me at Genesis 9 and Isaiah 54. For all generations, the rainbow is a sign of my covenant with you. And like the days of Noah, this is a sign, the rainbow, that I will never be angry with you again. So folks, if you don't teach your children what the true significance of the rainbow is, somebody else will. And the true significance, the memorial that God created for the rainbow is two things. Number one, it's to remember the covenant that we have with him. And number two, it's a sign that God will never again be angry with us. Those are two incredibly important things. And these memorials, they're, they're not to remember the bad things that happened to us. They're to remember how God rescued us out of those bad things. We, we don't remember the past and long for the past simply to long for the past. We remember the past as a sign of hope and encouragement for the future. Too often, as we're remembering the past, we're remembering the bad things that have happened to us, and stuff's happened to us all. And, and we're remembering those things, and we have a tendency to fix our minds and our thoughts on those bad things, on those problems. And as we do, we fall deeper and deeper into the pit of despair. So what we want to do as we remember, again, the memorial is to remember God's goodness, and so as we're remembering the past, it's an opportunity for us to establish hope and encouragement for the future. This has been a weird week, a weird week here around the church, a weird week in my family, and just a bunch of weird stuff happened. And, 
as we get past that, I, I don't want to focus on all the bad things that happened. I want to focus on how God rescued, delivered, and saved us from those individual situations. That's where my focus needs to be if I'm creating a memorial. Look with me at Psalm 42 and Psalm 77. Why am I discouraged? Why is my heart so sad? I will put my hope in God. I will praise him. I am deeply depressed. Therefore, I will remember you. When I am in anguish, I will remember the Lord's works and deeds. Now, I don't want you to raise your hand, but I would guess that if I asked you, how many of you have ever been discouraged? How many of you have ever been sad? How many of you ever have been deeply depressed or in mental anguish? And I'm pretty certain everybody's hand would go up. So what's the answer out of that? How, how do we not become sad and discouraged and depressed and in mental anguish? Well, the answer is to remember all the Lord's works and deeds. To put our focus on Him. And that's the key to all this. Folks, there's... There's a lot of thought processes on how to get us out of the depression and the sadness and the discouragement. And a lot of it involves taking pills. A lot of it involves doing deep counseling to try to remember all those bad things that happened to you. That's not the answer. The answer is to put our focus on Jesus Christ, to remember how he saves and he rescues and he delivers. And that's what we want to get from this. That's the memorial that we want to create, is to see how God is the one who saves and rescues and delivers. You know, science tells us that we're born with two fears. Now, they've identified 7,000, but they say we're born with two. We're, we're born with a fear of falling, and we're born with the fear of loud noises. Now, the Bible identifies one specific fear that man has been in bondage in all of our lives. We've been held in slavery to this one specific fear all of our life. And the only way that we can get delivered from that fear is through the death of another. Look with me at Hebrews chapter 2. Jesus through his death, destroyed the one holding the power of death, that is the devil, and freed those held in slavery all their lives by the fear of death. So we have been held in slavery all our lives by the fear of death. If you look at what's going on in our world today, that is the ultimate root fear. The ultimate root fear of, of different diseases and sicknesses and so forth is that I might die. The ultimate root fear of the economy crashing is that I might not have enough food, money to buy food and I'm going to die. The ultimate fear of, you name it, whatever that fear is, the ultimate underlying root fear is a fear of death. And so when you, are, when you struggle with that fear of death, the devil has you in bondage. And Jesus has come through his death to set us free from our fear of death. See, the, the, the price of freedom is often death, either the American soldier or Jesus Christ. So what we want to focus on today is we want to focus on what did the death of Jesus Christ really accomplish for us. Look with me at 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. It says that Jesus died for all so that we should no longer live for ourselves but for him. So one of the things that the death of Jesus has done for us, it allows us to stop living for ourselves, to stop living a selfish life and to live our life for God. And that's a that is a step in the right direction. So there's kind of six other main things I want to focus on today. And all of these are kind of big, fancy theological words. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to simplify that. Remember 2 Corinthians chapter 11? There is simplicity in Christ. So yes, we're going to use a bunch of these big, fancy words, but we're going to try to simplify it down to what it really means. And the first word that we're going to talk about is expiation. Expiation. Expiation is the removal of sin 
and of guilt. The removal of sin and guilt. Folks, the death of Jesus Christ has removed all guilt from our lives. And the guilt comes from sin. Look with me at Acts chapter 13. Everyone who believes in him is freed from all guilt. Now that's a tough one. Sir, there are a lot of us who struggle with guilt, and we struggle with guilt because of sin. We've done something, and that thing that we've done wasn't good, and all of a sudden the devil brings guilt in. Well, the death of Jesus Christ has removed all the sin and removed all the guilt from our lives. Look at Hebrews chapter 9. He has appeared one time to remove sin by his own death as a sacrifice. So expiation, the first thing that the death of Jesus Christ has accomplished for us is the removal of sin and the removal of guilt. The second thing we find is a word called propitiation. And propitiation, ultimately, it means the removal of wrath. But there's more. It's not only the removal of wrath, but it's the restoration of favor. So the death of Jesus Christ not only removed the wrath of God from us, but it also restored his favor to us so that God could be good to us every day, all the time. Look at some scriptures we find here. 1 John chapter 4, God loved us and he sent his son to be a propitiation for our sins. He sent his son to remove his wrath but not only to remove the wrath, but also to restore favor to us. That's how good God is. So we've seen a couple of things that the death of Jesus Christ has accomplished. Number one, expiation. It's the removal of sin and guilt. Propitiation is the removal of wrath, but it's also the restoration of favor. The third thing we see is reconciliation. Now, reconciliation is the removal of separation. The removal of separation. Sin created a barrier between us and God. And that barrier had to be removed in order that we could have a relationship with God. And so what did the death of Jesus Christ do? The death of Jesus Christ reconciled us to God it removed that separation, it broke down that wall, and it restored that relationship. Look at what we find in Colossians chapter 1. We have been reconciled through his death, and we have been presented holy, faultless, and blameless. Now, how did we get presented to God holy, faultless, and blameless? Was it through anything that we did, the good stuff that we did? Nope, not at all. It was through the death of Jesus Christ on the cross. That's how we were reconciled back to God. The word reconciled actually means to exchange for equivalent value. So think about this. We were enemies of God. We, we were hostile to God. We didn't want anything to do with God. There, there, there's two kingdoms. There's the kingdom of light, there's the kingdom of darkness. There's the kingdom of the devil, there's the kingdom of God. You're in one of those two. There's no middle ground there. And so we were in the kingdom of darkness. We, we were in the kingdom of Satan. And all of a sudden, through the death of Jesus Christ, we had the ability to be reconciled to God. We were exchanged for equivalent value exchanged for equivalent value. We were, we were sinners. We were hostile to God. And what did God do? Through the power of his love and through the death of Jesus Christ, God said, I am going to exchange my son for you, and it's going to be an equal exchange. Wow. So reconciliation is the removal of separation. It also provided redemption for us. Now, redemption is the removal of chains, the removal of chains. We were in bondage to the devil. We were in slavery. And something had to happen so that we could get removed out of that bondage and removed from the slavery to the devil. We, we needed redemption from three things. We needed redemption from the guilt of sin. We needed redemption from the curse of the law. 
and we needed redemption from the power of sin, and Jesus did it all. Through the death of Jesus Christ, it removed all of the chains that we had to these three particular things, and it restored us to a freedom with God simply through the death of Jesus Christ on the cross. Look at some scriptures with me, Romans chapter 3 and Galatians chapter 3. We have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Now let's stop right there for a second. That is a verse that many people use for evangelism, and you can use it for evangelism because it's true, right? We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, but it's not the gospel. <laughs> Because it's not good news. That's not good news. That I've all sinned and we've fallen short of the glory of God. And we use that verse in evangelism honestly to create guilt, shame, and condemnation. We use that verse to create that to hopefully draw us to God. Well, it would be far more effective if we just read one more verse. The chapter 3, verse 23, all have sinned and fallen short of the God glory of God, but verse 24 says we've been justified freely by grace through the redemption that is in Christ. That's the gospel. That's good news. And so that redemption has happened, that removal of chains has happened simply because of the death of Jesus Christ. Look at Galatians 3. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse. So the removal of change or redemption happened because of Jesus' death. Number five, it was the destruction of darkness. The destruction of darkness. The, the devil had a weapon, and the death of Jesus Christ was the removal of Satan's weapon. Now, the devil's weapon was the law, and the law created the sin which caused us to be in bondage. So the weapon that the devil had against us was law and sin. And when we would fall into that sin, the devil would bring guilt, shame, and condemnation. The devil would bring judgment. The devil would bring up wrath. The devil would bring up punishment. And all of those things, every time we sinned, would put us back in bondage. And that was the weapon that the enemy used against us. Now, folks, the death of Jesus Christ took that weapon from him. The, the devil is completely weaponless against you today. The only thing that he can do, the, there's no such thing as the devil made me do it. The only thing that the devil can do is put a thought in your mind. And that's why 2 Corinthians 10 says, we take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. So when that thought from the enemy comes, we compare it to, hey, what did the obedience of Christ do in my life? And if those two things disagree, we take that thought from the enemy captive. So that was the weapon that he had against us. And what we find is that victory over our enemies only comes through the death of Jesus. Look with me at Colossians chapter 2. When you were dead, Christ made us alive and forgave us all our sins, all our sins. It's the Greek word pas. It means each, it means every, it means everything. He forgave us all our sins by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed spiritual rulers. He shamed them publicly by his victory. So the death of Jesus Christ removed the weapon that Satan had. It was the complete destruction of darkness in our lives. And finally, what did the death of Jesus Christ do for us? What did it accomplish in our lives? Well, it accomplished a substitution. We were the ones who deserved the death penalty. We were the ones who sinned and fell short of the glory of God. We were the ones who should have been punished. We were the ones who should have had God's wrath upon us. That, that was us. But through the death of Jesus Christ, he became our substitute, and it became a removal of the death sentence. It was a removal of the sentence of death on our lives simply because Jesus died in our place. 
And as he died in our place, he said, I'm going to pay the penalty for their sins myself. Look what we find in Isaiah chapter 53. He bore our sicknesses. He carried our pains. He was pierced for our rebellion. He was crushed for our sins. The punishment for our peace was on him. We are healed by his wounds. We went astray, turning to our own way, and the Lord has punished him for the inequity of us all. <laughs> That's substitution. Jesus came and his death accomplished that so you and I would not have to pay that death penalty. You and I would not have to pay the price of our sins. So it was a removal of the death penalty from our lives. Now let me ask you a question. With all these, all these benefits, all of these wonderful things, what's our part in all of that? Nothing. Nothing. All of those things were accomplished by the death of Jesus Christ on the cross. Everything that we find there, expiation, propitiation, reconciliation, redemption, destruction, substitution, that was all Jesus. Now our part in all of this, 1 John chapter 4, to know and believe the love that God has for us. Remember what keeps us from abundant life? Ignorance and unbelief. Ignorance and unbelief. Ignorance and unbelief will keep you from the blessings that Jesus accomplished for you by his death. So our part in all of this is simply to know and believe everything that Jesus Christ has done for us. Now, are we thankful and do we remember and not forget the sacrifice of the American soldier? Absolutely, we do that today. But please don't forget the sacrifice. And please, as, as you're on your picnics, as you're out at the lake, as you're celebrating with your kids, as you're celebrating with your family, please remember the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on this Memorial Day weekend. He was the one who sacrificed his life so that we would be free. Now, free from what? From the fear of death. Because of the death of Jesus on the cross, Death simply becomes a shadow. Now there are those of us in here who might be afraid of snakes or, or mice or clowns or ticks or whatever. You don't have to be afraid of the shadow of those things. And because of what Jesus has done, death has become a shadow. And you and I have been freed from the fear of death. Psalm 23 we walk through the valley of the shadow of death. It's just a shadow of death. There's no reason to be afraid of it. I, I will not fear walking through the valley of the shadow. I will not fear. And the reason that I won't fear is because you are with me. John chapter 15, as we close today, no one has greater love than this than to lay down his life for his friends. So folks, what we've seen today through the death of Jesus Christ is that it has accomplished more than we could ever dream. It has removed our sin and our guilt. It has removed God's wrath and restored God's favor. It has removed the separation that was between us and God. It, it has removed the chains and the bondage that we were in. It has removed the weapon that the enemy had against you and it has removed our sentence of death. And all of that, all of that was accomplished because Jesus Christ was willing to go to the cross on our behalf. Amen? To establish a memorial for that and to remember the good things that we find through the death of Jesus Christ we're going to receive communion together today. If you did not receive a communion cup, would you please raise your hand? Communion at Abundant Life is open to all. Why? Because the Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians 11 that each person should examine himself before taking the bread 
or drinking the cup. And we examine ourselves not in light of what we've done. We examine ourselves in light of what Jesus has done. And so if we're remembering, what's this for? Well, it's a memorial. And we share in this memorial to remember the good things that God has done for us. That's what a memorial is. And if we talk about what, what is communion? What has it done? It's done three main things for us. It allows us to remember the sacrifice of Jesus. It allows us to proclaim his death. And it allows us to anticipate his return, 1 Corinthians 11. Those are the main things if we're trying to answer what communion is for. But there's more. Isn't there always more with our God? And the more is that the bread we share today is a remembrance that Jesus' body was broken for us. It was bruised. It was literally torn apart so that our bodies might be put back together. And this is one of the benefits that Jesus has done for us. This is what we remember today, that the body of Jesus Christ was broken so that ours may be healed. as you open the cup. It is a memorial of the precious blood of Jesus. Worth more than silver or gold. Having the power to redeem us from an empty life. And the blood of Jesus Christ, the juice that we share today is a memorial and a reminder that the blood of Jesus Christ has forgiven and removed all of our sins past present and future and that through his sacrifice the guilt and wrath of God has been completely removed and his favor restored on your life Father we thank you for a memorial of Jesus today an opportunity for us to remember him and what he has done and what his death has accomplished for us. Thank you, Father, that we can celebrate that together. Thank you that we can lift high the name of Jesus. We can praise the only one that's worthy. And so, Father, we just say thank you. Thank you for all that you've done. And we say thank you in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen.